another episode of Business Battery Pack. And uh, today this is a special episode. Um, I'm your host, Davion. I got my man, Frank Du. Today is a real special day because we've got the man, the myth, the legend, the king of the art of charm, all the way from uh, sunny California, Mr. Jordan Harbinger. Right on. Thanks for having me over or in your hangout. Thanks for coming on with us and uh, and being with us, Jordan. We appreciate it. So we're gonna get right into it. Um, now I know you got I know you from for, from a, a little while back. So um, right now, explain to to the people who you are and what you do. All right. So my name is Jordan Harbinger. I used to be uh, a lawyer, actually, Wall Street finance attorney, and that was boring, as you might imagine. So uh, during law school, I had set up a podcast show in my friend's basement, one of my business partner's basement, and it got really popular. And the show was about meeting girls, talking to girls, dating, and we were mostly just talking about our dating lives and just, you know, how we were learning a lot about making mistakes and all that kind of thing. And the show got really popular, got evolved into a business, and uh, we all quit our day jobs, moved out to New York, started the company, The Art of Charm, and eventually moved out to L.A., where we are now, where we've been doing this full-time for about five years now, and just sort of living the dream in the way that only an entrepreneur with a successful business can, just really enjoying being our own bosses and paving our own way. So it's a lot of fun, and it's, we're lucky, really lucky. Hey, so Jordan, I want to jump right into specifics. Um, sure. Can you explain your business model and, and how you sure. set up Art of Charm? Sure. Uh, basically, what happened was, like I said, we set up a podcast. We figured maybe 30 people will listen to this. And, you know, we're looking at 3 million plus downloads as of today. Uh, and it's just been this massive success. And I think part of the reason for that is is just uh, the fact that we were really authentic in what we do, kind of like you guys are doing now. Um, we just we didn't tr have a lot of pretense. We weren't sitting there talking about how awesome we were or any of that crap. We were just talking about how are we going to figure this out. And it turned out to be a problem that a lot of people have. So the business model now is we give out a ton of free content, just similar to what you guys are doing here, give out a lot of value. Uh, a lot of people will take in the content for, from us and they try things, and these things work. These these bits of advice, these um, these sort of plans that people can have to improve themselves, skill sets uh, that are developed by us or developed by people we have on the show. And then they go, hmm, all right, this has been working for me. What can I do? What more can I do? And so we offer a paid membership site called the Art of Charm Academy, where guys can learn a lot of skills remotely from us using video, audio. Uh, social network, all the stuff that we have on our online university, uh, theartofcharmacademy.com. And we also have our live training programs here in Los Angeles and in New York City where guys will actually fly in from around the world. They'll stay with us at the Art of Charm headquarters and they go through 60 hours, so like six days of residential training where we have drills, exercises, we take guys out at night, take guys out during the day with professional coaches and we teach guys how to be more outgoing, social, meet and attract women. So really it's it's like a very hands-on experience where guys can go out and learn how to meet and attract girls uh, and also network for business and learn how to make strong connections with people in general. But obviously the, the funnest part of it is to teach guys how to meet and attract girls. Because if you tell a bunch of people or a bunch of dudes, I'm going to teach you how to meet people and network, they're like, whatever. But if you're like, actually you're going to get a lot of girls, they're like, okay, okay, wait, what? I'm listening now, you know? <laughs> Yeah, they so, want to. They want to know how to pick up chicks, mostly. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of that. Yeah. But it, but but you you go beyond that is what you're saying. You're really getting deeper into absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you were a lawyer before. I was. Yeah, I was so, a lawyer before. So tell me, what 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 mindsets are different from being a lawyer to being an entrepreneur and starting your own thing? Like what, what, what different in mentality did you have to make a switch from? That's a good question actually. And it's one thing that a lot of people ignore. Uh, being an entrepreneur or starting your own business really is a mindset shift in that when you have a regular job, I don't care if you're a lawyer or you work at Walgreens selling, you know, chapstick, it doesn't matter that 
when you're in a job where somebody else is your boss, somebody else is dictating your hours, somebody else is making your schedule, someone's telling you what to wear, when to come in, and how to do your job, that's easy in a lot of ways because if if I tell you, all right, guys, you got to be here at 11:30 a.m. Pacific time, put on the headphones, turn on the cameras, you're like, okay, I can do that. But if you're do if you're the one making the plans, you don't know if what you're doing is a successful way to make money or if what you're doing is a complete waste of your time. You you don't know. You have to test a lot, and you have to be self motivated. You know, today I got up at 8:30, but when I was in college. Man, you couldn't pry me out of bed before 10 a.m. if you were lucky because I didn't have class till 11.30, so why would I get up early? But when you're an entrepreneur, you got to manage your own schedule. You're responsible for yourself. If you don't work, you're not making any money. If you're not trying to figure out a new way to maximize revenue or to get people in the door or to market, you're not making any money. If you just work at Walgreens or if you're just a lawyer, you show up to the office you do some stuff that people from three levels up hand down to you. You get, you go home, and at the end of a pay period, you get your paycheck, and that's it. So was there ever a time when you started your business where you felt like, wow, I started a business, but it doesn't seem to be going as well as I think it should? Was there ever a point that you had a little bit of doubt? And if you did have that doubt, how did you handle that? Because a lot of people get that. Uh, yeah, that's super common. It makes perfect sense. That kind of doubt comes into play – Every day um, at, at some level. Uh, in the beginning of the business, we were wondering if it would even be a business. And then at even when we started making some money, we were like, is this going to be something we can do full time or is this just a hobby? And then once you get to that point where you're like, do I quit my job or do I do this business full time or do I just stay at work and, and try to balance it or do I stop doing this all together? You have to make that decision, and a lot of it involves risk taking. That most people aren't really up to the; they're not really up to that sort of challenge or up to that pressure. So it's tough to it's tough to sit there and go, "I'm going to gamble on this." Like I don't when I go to Vegas and, and party, I don't gamble because I don't like to lose. Nobody likes to lose. Nobody likes to quit their job only to find out that their business is making eight thousand dollars a year and they got to live in their parents' basement. You know that's not fun. So what did you do to make sure that you know that you didn't lose when you started this business? Like, how did you um, ensure you were, your success? Yeah. It's it, that's the toughest thing, right? Is you're never going to be assured of your success. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk to guys like Mark Cuban, who who are billionaires. Mm -hmm. They're competitive. They're hardworking. But even then, when they make an investment or something, you ever watch Shark Tank? You know, you, when when they make an investment, they don't know if that's going to be successful. They're just basing it on experience. So. What I had done and what the other guys here had done um, on the team, you know, the guys who co-founded the company with me, what we did is we said, okay, we're making some money. It looks like we're going to continue doing that. We really need more time to put into the business in order to continue making money. So I guess at this point the best thing we can do is quit our jobs, take a pay cut for a while, and deal with some insecurity. So you're never really going to be assured of your success you just have a hunch that you're going to be able to do it. And that means that you're willing to – you have to already be willing to live, sleep, eat, and breathe everything that you're doing uh, for your business. You can't be thinking about what you're going to do on the weekend because you might not get a weekend. You might have to work all weekend. I mean, I remember working every day all weekend for years, and it's fine if you love it. Um, it sucks if you're just trying to get a paycheck. If you're just trying to get a paycheck, being an entrepreneur, starting your business, that is not for you. Um, if you just want a paycheck, go do a job, start business on the side, make a couple extra hundred, a couple thousand bucks on the side each month. But if you love your business, that's really what's going to make it work for you. Um, and even then, you're going to fail. You're going to have a lot of failure. Even within the art of charm, we've had a lot of failure. You know, we've had ideas flop. We've had certain uh, marketing initiatives get zero ROI, but cost a lot of money. I remember. A couple of years ago, we had a television commercial, and it was in Manhattan, and we were like, man, this is really expensive, but it's on during prime time. It's on, on the channels we want. It's got a good commercial. It looks professional. There's no way this can fail. We got zero sales from that, zero, mm -hmm. and it cost a ton of money, and we were, you know, you just have to, you have to know that, and I'm sure you've heard the expression, never gamble more, never bet more than you can afford to lose, and that's a big one in business. You know, 
you can test something and you can throw 10 grand into it. But if you know that you're going to go out of business, if you don't make that 10 grand back, then you're making, you're betting too much. You know, you have to be able to lose that 10 grand, never see a dime of it come back and still be able to eat breakfast or, you know, eat, feed yourself, pay rent. You need to be able to do that. So it, it always, you can never try to guess what's going to be successful. You always have to test like crazy and you can all, you got to always make sure that you're never betting more than you can afford to lose. You know, if you're going, well, if we just buy this, then for sure we're going to make money off of this. If you don't know that that's true based on testing that you've done yourself, then don't do it. Don't make the spend. Start really small. Because if we had, we've, we've bet too much in the past and we've had serious issues because of it. And a lot of it's just by the grace of God that we're still here. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like just lucky. Or you find an investor who goes, okay, you guys did something stupid, but we can recover from this, you know, or you get a strategist that makes it possible for you to recover. Or you just get lucky in something else that you did that you didn't think was going to work, made you enough money to pay rent that month, you know, but you can't count on those types of things. Did you, so being you all ever take on... So being that you're in the art of charm and things of that nature, how did you find your particular audience? How did you find the people that that was interested in what you had to offer? Well, the podcast that we'd started, we originally thought this isn't necessarily going to be something that's popular, right? But the fortunate part about it was since we started that as a hobby, the podcast, uh, if you search for The Art of Charm in iTunes, you'll find our app and you'll find our podcast. Um, I used to listen to that podcast. I know. Oh, you did. It was you and your brother AJ. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, is cool. That, is AJ how you... still part of the business? He is. He's the CEO okay. of the business. He okay, drives. Cool. He's he's in the driver's seat all the time, yeah. making sure that we don't do something stupid. Um, <laughs> and and that's been lucky too. You know, he has a good hunch for. You know, all of us have good BS detectors, and he's got a really good um, sort of worst case scenario planning mindset where he goes. We, we'll get all really excited about something. He goes, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be great. And then he goes, but just in case it's not, let's keep this amount of money in the bank or let's have this as a backup plan. And you find yourself a lot of times going, Phew, good thing that we had that backup plan and we've been out of luck, you know. So he does a lot of that. And, and so, yeah, it's it's been fortunate that, that we've had that. But in terms of finding our customer base, we had a demand-driven business, and what that means is we started the podcast. The podcast got really successful. It got really popular. It got picked up by satellite radio. You know, it ended up being something that uh, we knew that people were listening to it. We had statistics. We, we offered some phone coaching on there as a small sort of upsell. All right, if you guys like what we do, you know, we're doing phone coaching for 100 bucks an hour back, you know, five years ago, and we had a bunch of customers come in. And then we had other people say, listen, you know, why, why don't you have live programs? Oh, well, that's a pain, but we'll test it. All right, we're going to have one boot camp. It's going to be five months from now. Who wants to sign up? Well, we got a bunch of people to sign up. So then we thought, okay, let's do a few more of these. And then we started doing more, started doing more, and then we had to hire coaches. So we didn't just start off hiring coaches, buying a facility, starting to sell something that was unproven. We tested small things and then tested larger things. And then when those large things started to generate revenue for us, we started to maximize that process, right? So we started to say, okay, we're filling up one boot camp every month. Let's see if we can do two boot camps every month. All right, how about three? You know, and that's, that's the way we were able to grow without burning out and, and you know, burn it, sinking the ship with having too much infrastructure. We, in fact, had to catch up to demand, which is a good thing, a good problem to have where you're trying to figure out how to service all the clients that you have as opposed to going, oh, crap, now we've got to find clients and we're out of luck. You know, you've got paychecks to cut. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes, that makes perfect sense. Okay. Let me ask you this. Um, the market, you know, when you guys, when you started, um, you know, there was a lot of attention to the, to, to the whole pickup market and, and, you know, uh, the, the relationship thing. So how did you guys distinguish yourselves from all the other noise that was out, you know, and how did you fine tune what you do? Uh, well, there was, yeah, there were a lot of these like pickup guys out there and we thought, why would we compete with them? And then we realized that the quality of service for their products were really low. The quality of their product itself, the service and products were really low. 
hoping there's not somebody out there who has integrity, who's running a tight ship, who's managing quality. So we started doing that a lot. We started making sure that the products we were selling were of high quality, the stuff that we would want to buy, stuff that we would want to consume. Um, and we thought, okay, the level of training that people are getting is really low. You know, we were going, I, we were taking our competitors' boot camps and going, what the heck, this is being held at a Starbucks? That's That sucks. You know, or this is being held in some crappy motel <laughs> conference room or we're meeting at some guy's apartment. You know, what the heck is that? So then we started to realize, okay, if we get our own training facility, we're going to be leagues above. Um, and, you know, oh, this guy's got a membership site product out. Well, the software that it's being used on really sucks or it's really clunky. So we custom coded nicer software that was really easy to use, that was really good and had all of our functionality uh, in place. And so that was the type of thing that separated us from the competition because we really had a higher level of service. And that what that allowed us to do was price our products and services higher than a lot of our competition. So when uh, – and that's good in a lot of ways. One, you're making more money for having fewer clients, which means you don't have to market as much because you're only taking the high end. Um, it also means that if – some Joe Schmo wakes up on his mom's couch one day and says, I'm going to write an ebook about picking up chicks. He can't really compete with us because he's going, I'm going to sell my book for $37 and yours is $67. That's fine, but it doesn't matter because people aren't buying our stuff because it's the cheapest. They're buying it because it's the best. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can, you're always going to lose when you compete on price because then you're competing for the low end and you're always going to find somebody who's willing to steal or create something that's crappy in order to get a lower price out of it. But if you have the best product out there, you can have the highest price and the only way people can compete with you is if they offer a higher level of quality, which is really hard to do because if it was possible, we would figure out how to do it and we'd do it ourselves. So um, in your field, I did a little bit of research and I just want to know being that a lot of other uh, people that do business, they say it's good to know the other your competition, the other people in your market. So I want to ask exactly. you, do, are you familiar with all the other people that do stuff everyone. similar to what you do? S yeah, absolutely. Pretty much everyone in the industry, I know them, either personally or I've, I've you know been familiarized with their products and services. So if I was to throw out a couple names, uh, maybe let's say I researched Mystery Method. He's real popular. And let's mm -hmm. say uh, Ross Jeffries. He's pretty popular. Sure. Uh, I guess a Brad P. He's real popular. So how would you say that the art of charm differs from the competition that's of that caliber? Sure. I mean, the, the primary difference that you'll see between the art of charm and everyone else is that we aren't using a lot of the sort of pre-scripted pickup lines or tactics that a lot of the competition uses. Uh, we also are very normal guys. We relate to our audience in a much better way. If you look at some of the pickup guys, they're like, wear this goofy hat and goggles to the bar. <laughs> and and yes. maybe that's fine if you live in Hollywood, but I don't see you guys dressing like that where yeah. you're at. That would look ridiculous. People would laugh at you and they'd be right to yeah. do so. Um, <laughs> you know, and a lot of the other guys are using quick win hypnosis type stuff to get girls, but that stuff's creepy. It makes you a weirdo. <laughs> if you're using it, you seem weird because you are. And the problem with that is guys that are normal like you and I and everyone watching this, they don't want to go out and be someone else when they're trying to meet and attract girls or make exactly. friends. That seems weird, right? Like right. You, when you guys go out, you don't want to go, oh, who I am right now is not good enough. Let me put on this pink fuzzy hat and see what happens. <laughs> That's not a good way to learn. And people know that in their gut. Normal people know that in their gut. And that's, again, one of the reasons why we're able to outprice these guys. And, and I mean, sorry, pr out sort of price higher than these guys is because people who are normal, who are sane and emotionally stable, they have jobs, they have careers who are able to pay for a high end service. Those people know that they're not going to get results from that other stuff because it's ridiculous. So if you look at some of the guys who are popular, and I don't, I don't mean to talk smack about. The competition. Brad P is an awesome dude. I love him. He's really nice. Um, his stuff is cool. Like I, I know him personally very well. He's an awesome dude. Um, I am saying that yes, you have to be familiar with your competition. A lot of the competition in this industry, uh, again, you know, 
I don't mean Brad P, for example. Um, he's he delivers quality, but I do mean that outside of the Art of Charm and a handful of others, there's just a lot of scammers who are like, I just want to make a quick buck, you know, and that's no good because you're in this business to help people, not to scam people out of their money, not to make false promises. So what we do as well is deliver a ton of free content at theartofcharm.com, for example. And if you give away a ton of stuff and it's free and nobody has to give away the farm for it, they can download that free stuff, they can try it for themselves, and then when it works for them, they go, all right, now I'm ready to make a purchasing decision because I know that what this company has to offer is legit because I've tried it. If you look at other people's marketing and it's like three weird tricks to get made with supermodels every day, <laughs> You don't know if that works, and they're not going to tell you what it is because they want you to buy something first, which means you're taking all the risk, and that's not cool. If I take the risk out of the equation and I say, have a ton of my stuff for free, try it yourself, no obligation, and I don't mean like give me your credit card and then try it. I mean yeah. go to theartofcharm.com, download the podcast, download the videos, look at all the stuff we have there. It's free. You never even need to tell me who you are if you don't want to. And then go out and try it, and then you'll be back because it works, you know. And if you take the risk out of the equation for the consumer, you're going to have a lot more customers because people are inherent distrustful of stuff like this, and they should be. So, so let's get into the nitty gritty for people that that haven't been to your site yet, and we're going to make sure they go mm -hmm. before the end of the show. Give us sure. an example of what exactly it is you're teaching. Give us like sure. maybe one, one, one or two, two things for somebody that has no sure. clue. So. Sure. So one of the major concepts that we work on here at The Art of Charm is nonverbal communication. Um, because you can have all the fancy words and pick up lines or whatever you want in the whole world and it's not going to make a bit of difference because what women are looking for is, is a sense of confidence. And I can't just tell someone to be confident or tell them to look confident because that's like telling someone to be taller. They go, sure, sounds great, but how do I do that? How the heck do I do that? You know, That's not something that most people know how to do. So what we do know from science, not from stupid theories from the internet, we know from science that people, especially women, judge other people's confidence based on their nonverbal communication. What that means is body language, vocal tonality, eye contact, the way you sit, stand, walk, and talk, right? So if I have a guy who comes in and he's all hunched over and he's got bad body language and stuff like that, I want, I want to correct that. The team here, there's actually a boot camp going on right now downstairs at the Yard of Charm here in L.A., we want to correct their body language. We want to correct their posture. We want to correct their eye contact in the way that they sit, stand, walk, and talk. And the way that we do that is guys will come in. Um, we have them introduce themselves. We take some notes on the way that they're presenting themselves. And we have a female assistant instructor that will come in, and we'll teach them some basic banter, flirting, and attraction skills over the first few hours of the boot camp. Then we have them apply those skills on the assistant female instructor, but we're actually videotaping the whole experience for them. So while we're sitting there, we're videotaping what they're doing, right? Like we can see the way that they're presenting themselves uh, on a camera, and then we can show that to them and say, hey, listen, this is what you look like to other people, and this is what you should look like <laughs> to other people, and this is the way you act when you're around your friends, but this is the way you act when you're around a good-looking girl. Like what's the difference between you know, these two images, right? And we want to sort of blend these together because that's who you really are. We want you to be able to be who you really are when you're a little bit nervous around a good-looking girl, right? And that's the essence of the art of charm is taking your natural confidence and making it something that you can present easily every day. It's not really tricky. There's not a whole lot of um, secret, me you know, secret methodologies. It's all about bringing out your natural charisma and if you don't have that much, then we'll work on that. You know, we'll work on making your voice louder. We'll work on making your posture better. We'll work on improving your eye contact. We'll work on making you a little bit more funny or loosening up around the opposite sex especially. Because once tension enters the equation, right, when you're out and you see that girl and you're like, whoa, man, that girl's fine, then you feel that tension come up in your body. You feel your shoulders tighten. You feel your stomach tighten. You feel your neck tighten up. You feel like you're a little bit shy, and you're like, "Why is this? Why is this happening to me all of a sudden?" It's because you have a little bit of anxiety or nervousness associated with maybe talking to that person, or maybe you work in a small company or a large company, and you see the CEO walking down the hall, and you straighten up in your chair, and you're like, "Oh, I better, all right, I better make sure that my computer monitor's on and look like I'm working hard." It's very similar. It's a very similar process, 
So if you can be very relaxed around people that would normally cause tension, you're going to have a huge advantage because you can think more clearly and you can perform better when you're not feeling like you're about to swallow your, <laughs> your guts, you know? So what you're doing is you're, you're teaching people. You're basically getting getting guys to change their core behavior. You're getting them to change behavior. Um, mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, that's very hard, very difficult. So Definitely. how do you how do you measure your success and how do they measure their success like is, is there some sort of goals that you guys set in the beginning or yeah, absolutely. Is, yeah, it, like, absolutely. is it like, a, is it like what, what the end result is that like a telephone number is it like a, a girlfriend like what is the goal most of the guys that come through the program their goal is they want a girlfriend uh, eventually they want to get married and have kids at some point in their life right that's the end goal for most of our clients it's not trying to pick up as many chicks as possible um, some of the guys do come through for that, but you know, usually the younger dudes. And, and so the measurements of success for us is we take a baseline when you come into the program. Uh, when you come into the program, you'll tell what it is that you want, what you're looking to do. And the reason that that's important is because after the first couple of days, you're probably going to exceed those goals. Like if your goal is, I just want to be able to talk to girls and get phone numbers, you're going to be able to do that probably at the end of the first or second day of boot camp. And that's important for us because when a client comes in, they usually know what they want, but they don't necessarily know what they need. So a guy might come in and say, I just want to be able to talk to girls and get phone numbers and not be freaked out. Or I want to be able to connect really deeply with people because I have no problem meeting girls, but I have a problem finding girls that I really like. You know, And so we go, okay, let's teach him how to generate rapport and connect with people strongly. Or let's teach this guy how to be more outgoing and friendly and connect with people more, uh, more quickly. And so we can have some measurable results. So for the guy who comes in and says, you know, it's really hard for me to approach women that I don't know, success for him might be a phone with 10 new phone numbers in it. But I want him to have that at the end of the first few days of boot camp because I want him to see that he can improve this, you know, this much instead of just improving this much during the boot camp. We want everybody to exceed their goals really quickly. And so in order to do that, we want to produce measurable results. Like whether that's phone numbers or solid interactions with a certain amount of people or a certain caliber of girl that he maybe never thought he'd be able to get, we want him to be able to exceed that. Because you don't just want somebody leaving your program going, well, I felt good the whole time, that's fun, or I had fun. Those are good side effects, but we want guys to have actual results, not just that like, not just like motivational speeches, like you can do it, that's great, but it doesn't mean anything and it fades away right after your program. We want guys to have meaningful results that they can replicate once they leave. We don't want guys leaving and then going, well, it was fun while I did it, but now I can't do it anymore. We want guys to be able to keep those results after their program. So we do, we come up with benchmarks uh, for each student and we come up with goals for each student and we make sure that they're actively working towards those. Do we, do we lose you? No, I'm here. Oh, okay, okay. Frank, you had another yeah, question. That was the end of the sentence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, 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 I mean, what you're providing is really a service that, you know, like I said, I don't see a lot of people get elsewhere. Um, but with, you know, we talked about those other guys and what they do. Um, and I know a couple years ago, you know, the whole scene kind of really got a big spotlight shine. shine yeah, with that it. TV show. Right? Yeah. So, right. so right. do you feel like, that kind of publicity exposed uh, helps what you do or it hurts it? Um, in a, that's a good question. Actually, in a way, uh, it's been it, – yeah, it's annoying to us in, in the first place because we're like, oh, great. Now everybody thinks we're like these goofballs on TV, right? <laughs> but at the end, it's, a, it's great publicity for the business because you get guys going, well, I Googled this TV show – and I thought it was interesting, but then I thought the stuff that they were doing was really stupid, but then I thought maybe there's something else out there. And then those people will eventually find our show or our company, and that's good for us because then those people go, hey, you know, I was looking for this thing about the show, and I found you guys instead, and I listened to you guys for six months, and now I'm taking your program. So anything that brings new people into the sort of folds of awareness that this stuff exists is good for us. Um, and we, we tend to weed people out really well because if you listen to our show and you go, 
No, oh, these guys are talking about making friends and dating girls and doing business. I don't care about that stuff. Well, then we're that's not the type of guy we want in our program anyway. But if we get a guy who's like, I was looking for some information on picking up girls, and I found this awesome show about mm-hmm. relationships, business, and just being a good, like, cool dude who has a cool lifestyle. I like this. Now, that's the kind of guy that I want in here at Art of Charm. That's the kind of guy that we want to see here because – those are the guys that understand the full picture. You can't just impress a girl with fancy words. You, you, she's going to want to see the full picture. A guy who's got his stuff together. A guy who's got his business handled. A guy who's got a good social circle of friends. Not the guy who plays video games in his apartment all day by himself and has an empty phone book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so tell me this. Uh, have you always been good at the auto charm or was that, or did you have to learn that or, or was that something that that somebody had to train you on, or, or or have you just always been a ladies' man? And it and ha- and now that you are teaching the art of charm, is there ever a moment where you run into something where you're not comfortable or you don't get the girl? Is that is that ever a, a happening for you? Sure. Let me tackle those two questions in order. Basically, the f- that's I definitely was not always somebody who is charming by any stretch. Uh, I used to be really shy. I used to be really quiet. Um, even in law school, I was really quiet, and that was, you know, seven, seven, eight years ago now. Um, the way that I learned this stuff was by going out and testing things. And, you know, as you heard in the beginning of the show, I'm really, really big on testing things. I'd learn something, I'd go out and try it. I'd learn something from that experience, and then I'd go out and try something slightly different. Um, and doing that over and over and over for several years makes it easier to find ways to win. That's the same in business, the same in sports. You know, you you don't shoot a basketball or lift weights or jog the same way that you did when you first started doing it. There's no way. If you did, you'd be terrible at everything that you did. If you never learned from your mistakes or anything, you'd be terrible at everything you did. So the, I had to learn this the hard way. And one of the ways that, that I did learn originally – was by going through a lot of books and then interviewing the author of that book on the show or going to a coach and being like, okay, show me something. All right, now I'm going to interview you and ask a bunch of questions or hiring uh, a personal trainer to show me how to lift weights really well or uh, hiring a CrossFit coach to show me how to do CrossFit. I always want to learn from people who are good at what they do because I don't want to have to figure out everything for myself. That's why this course at the Art of Charm is so important. You can figure out how to meet and attract women and connect with people really well. It's just going to take you 10 years. Um, If you don't want to spend 10 years doing it, then come to the Art of Charm, cut your learning curve way down, and start getting the results quicker. It's an investment in yourself, you know? Um, And as for the other question, uh, you know, is this something that... Uh, actually, why don't I let you repeat the second question just to make sure I answer it correctly and completely? Oh, the second question was basically, do you always get the girl now? And if and, oh, and how do you handle not. how do you handle the situations that you go through now? Sure. No, I, I definitely don't always get the girl now, and that's something that if anybody tells you they're always getting the girl, they're lying to you, probably <laughs> for marketing or ego purposes. No one gets everything that they want in life in any category. And that's an important thing to note because a lot of the marketing out there does center around, you know, go five for five, get every girl <laughs> <Yeah>. you want. <laughs> and that's just not real. Um, you're, a lot of what you do to go out and get the girl, for example, is not has nothing to do with you. If you go out and you talk to a girl uh, and she's not in the mood or she's married, she's not going to necessarily want to deal with it. Or she's, you know, she's out with a bunch of her friends. She doesn't necessarily want to deal with it. Uh, sometimes it has nothing to do with you, you know? Um, so when I, and I handle rejection that way, the same way I handle rejection in business. You don't take it personally. You realize that there's not always something that you can do. It's definitely not something. Uh-oh. Did we lose? I learn something from it if you can, you know? So, so, um, what's the reaction you get when, um, when, when women find out what it is that you do? Um, I'm very honest about what I do. I do it. I tell people up front because I don't want them to find out the hard way, uh, namely by Googling me after we've gone out a couple times <laughs> because then it'll seem really shady, right? Like if they have to find out on the internet, it's like, wait, wait, what? Why don't you tell me this? It must be shady. So I tell people what I do. Women find it extremely interesting. They want to talk about it a lot. Um, that's like their favorite topic of conversation for a lot of the date. 
Um, if, if So I try not to bring it up too quickly because then it will just dominate the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and that becomes problematic. I want to talk about her, not not just say the same, you know, same stuff about me the whole time. So, women are very interested in it. Um, that's an, that's one of the reasons why it's it's um, it's a popular topic is because women are talking about this stuff constantly, and they realize the need for it in the industry. A lot of our word of mouth is spread by females and not mm-hmm. necessarily by guys. Guys have a lot of ego attached to you know get the girl, learn how to meet women. They've got a lot of ego attached to it. Women are like, why doesn't every guy know this? When they hear about it? You know, guys, all guys need this. Every guy needs this. And guys are like, I don't need this, man. That's stupid. You know, and then they're listening <laughs> to it. They're listening to it on their iPod secretly. <laughs> yeah, they say so they're like, no. And then, then you catch them in the back of that room, like with the iPod yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're like, so- no, that, that sounds stupid. Bookmark, you know. <laughs> yeah. Now, see, when I listen to your podcast, um, sometimes you have guys on there, and um, and and to your credit, too, you guys kind of sometimes you'll call bullshit on guys when they're saying stuff yeah. and you know, they're not legit. But how do you deal with, from a professional level, you know, uh, interacting with other other instructors or other coaches that maybe have a philosophy that's different from yours? Well, it's important to treat people with respect all the time, even if people are saying things that I think is complete crap. You know, I I won't necessarily call that out unless they're trying to say that to my audience. You know, I'm happy to to tell somebody on my show that I think what they're saying sounds ludicrous. But if we're, say we're presenting at a talk, I'm not going to get into an argument philosophically about, you know, one thing or another. Uh, I was giving a talk recently uh, and I had another competitor say, you know, whatever you teach, this stuff is stupid, and you just stole it from me, and it was ridiculous because this person teaches hypnosis, which is garbage um, in terms of the seduction stuff. And so I was like, all right, whatever, you're entitled to your opinion. And, you know, he was really upset that I wasn't uh, taking him up on his on his, his invitation to get into a fight. And I realized, you know, when people do that, they just want attention. I'm not going to give this person attention. I'm going to treat people with respect even if they treat me with disrespect because it just reflects on them. It makes them look stupid. And everybody at the talk afterwards was like, wow, I can't believe that moron decided to do that. That was so stupid. And, you know, you don't want to lower yourself down to their level. And I know it sounds almost a like a cliche, but if, if you keep your – if you keep things uh, to at your bar, like you don't stoop down and don't embarrass yourself – then when other people try to attack you like that, it doesn't matter. So I always try to treat people with respect. That's why I don't talk smack about competitors publicly. Um, I don't mention people by name. You know, I just talk about the benefits of the art of charm because a lot of that stuff will reflect poorly on you, and it always comes back around. You know, it always comes back around. If you talk negatively about somebody, you eventually you're going to have to face that person, and you want to be able to face that person knowing that you handled it maturely no matter what kind of crap came out of their mouth, you know, three yeah. months ago. That incident that you're talking about, was that on a talk show? No, it was at an event where there was a bunch of people in an audience and we were all giving talks that were about an hour long. And oh, okay. this person had gone before me and I went after them and they were like, see, everything is the same. And I, I was I had to point out that just because I was scheduled after him doesn't mean I invented my talk between the time when he finished and when I went on stage and everyone laughed because it was obvious I didn't just – invent my talk in the 10 minute break between <laughs> his talk and mine. So, I mean, his argument had no credibility. It just made him look stupid, you know, but I didn't have to go, Oh, you're an idiot, a liar. You know, I didn't have to say that everyone knew because of the way that he was acting. And again, it's that non it's like that nonverbal communication of that attitude speaking louder than words. You know, I could have addressed it, but there was no need. Everybody with two brain cells to rub together knew that he was full of crap. I didn't need to point it out to make myself look better. Good stuff. Hey, so I want to switch directions just really quickly and get a little sure. bit more into the nitty gritty of the business yeah. side of your business. Um, you Definitely. mentioned you mentioned that um, you know you guys have kind of gotten into the software business, and um, we talked to um, a guy that uh, that does some marketing also. How much of your market is is found and and developed online, and how much of that is offline? And what strategies do you use? Hmm. Uh, most of our marketing is done online. Um, the reason being that you know shows presented online are 
client base is global and it's also somewhat niche you know uh, self-help and personal growth in general is best marketed online simply because there's not a very good way again like the commercial that we tested we had the whole city of Manhattan with a TV commercial and we got zero ROI mm -hmm. um, yet we can produce a free podcast that goes out to a few thousand people but those people select that media for themselves they're not passively consuming it so that is really important. No, gone are the days when you can just pump $25 million into a TV campaign and see positive return on that investment. Now you need to carefully select where your advertising dollars go and you need to target as specifically as you can. And so almost all of our marketing is done online. Very, we've tested offline marketing. It's never gotten us a good ROI, so we, we've since given up on that and, and we're not very interested in it, to, to say the least. The only offline marketing that we do is sort of a hybrid where we have meetups in LA every once a month every on a Sunday, uh, including this Sunday, we have a meetup in LA. So if you're in LA, come to our meetup group, go to meetup.com, search for the Art Charm, you'll find our meetup group. Um, and then we'll, we give a short presentation in person. But even then, those people find out about that meetup group online. So online is really the way to go testing offline media is just not something that we're willing to do anymore just because it's given us such a crappy ROI the the only other possible offline marketing I would say is if I get invited to give a speech somewhere to a uh, hundred plus guys maybe 100 to 600 or even more people that's offline right and I want those people are in a room with me that gives me the chance to present something like this talk uh, only live to a large audience and that's fine. That'll generate business, but we don't do we don't organize those seminars ourselves. You know, we will go to other people's as a guest, and in return, we'll have a chance to advertise what we do. Who's your ideal customer? I mean, who do you who do you who do who do you desire as your ideal customer, and who usually comes to you? Are, are there any patterns or any similarities you see? Yeah, most of our customers are successful people, mm -hmm. in that a lot of them have their stuff together professionally. Um, it doesn't mean that they're a rich doctor or a lawyer. We do get college students, and we get a lot of military guys in, which is you know a different kind of profession. But we get guys in there in here who are like, you know, I just broke up with somebody, or I just got divorced, or they're like, you know, I'm already okay with girls, but I want to be better with people. Or the occasional, hey, you know, I don't have a long relationship history because I worked overseas in Kuwait for three years since college. I, I need to get back in again. We get a lot of those guys. Um, the stereotype that people have of us in other companies in the niche are, oh, you've got some like nerdy dudes and suspenders in your living room learning how to pick up chicks. And it's not like that at all. The guys that we have in here are very, very successful people in, in pretty much every area of their life, except they'd like to get better with people. And that's one of the reasons that we end up being more high-end is because we don't have a guy that lives in his mom's basement watching anime all day trying to figure out how to lose his virginity at age 40. We don't get those guys. Those guys don't even, they don't come in here because they Because they're listening they, they to the podcast really for free. <laughs> right, they listen to the podcast for free and they're going, they're whatever, on. you know, I agree. Yeah. yeah. So, but but it, it. It, it, it's interesting that, you know, most of your customers are, are already successful in the professional realm, and yet they're so unsuccessful in, I guess, the personal relationship realm. It, are, are there any underlying issues that you see or, or common traits that you see when you deal with them up close and personal? Well, every client is definitely different, um, and mm. we tailor the training to every client. But one of the major factors is the, the analytical mindset. So we get a lot of computer guys, a lot of successful entrepreneurs that are really good with analytical systems, a lot of engineers, and they're going, because people aren't very um, logical in the way that we think and flow. We're very we're emotional, right? Because we go based on we we're got it based on emotion. So a guy who's really good with systems might not be really good with emotional intelligence. And so what we do at the Art of Charm is we teach emotional intelligence, but we teach it in a logical system that anyone can learn and master. So we're taking we're sort of acting as the translator between the analytical part of your brain that says two plus two equals four and we're turning it into something emotional where you're going, okay, well, she said this, and so that probably means something like this because I'm running it through this filter of where the analytical meets the emotional, and that's, the, that's what we teach. That's the, the secret sauce of the art of charm is translating those types of signals. 
So in a sense, it's kind of like a thinking outside the box. Yes, it's thinking outside the box. It's learning the the emotional language of communication. It's learning uh, how people think and how they react to certain stimuli and how to communicate those those same positive traits yourself. It's human hacking is what it is. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, because a lot of times I notice that people do say that, uh, that the opposite sex will say one thing and do another. So I kind of get what you're saying there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So before yeah. before we let you go, um, some of our, our our nerdy viewers that may not have the money to sign up for a class, can you give, sure. give them maybe two or three tips just so that they can um, definitely, you know, yeah, definitely improve themselves. I would say one of the biggest problems that guys have is they don't know when they're. Well, all right, let, let me back up a little bit. Uh, women, when they see you, that's when you're on the radar, right? Your first impression is not made when you want to make a first impression. And so what that means is a lot of guys will be at the party or at the bar and they're going, all right, I've been here for like an hour drinking my beer in the corner. I see that girl that I like from psychology class. I'm going to go up and talk to her. And then they walk up there and she's like, uh, nope, thanks. And you're like, damn, what happened? I thought my impression was good. I had my cool guy walk on. I had all this, you know what I mean? So the problem is your first impression is when you become a blip on her radar. And what that means is when you walk in through the door, she sees you walk in the door, you're all shy, you're sitting in the corner being weird, that's your first impression. Your first impression was not when you finally got the balls to go up and talk to her. That's the problem that a lot of guys face is they don't realize that. So you got to realize that you're, you're, you're on as soon as you're in public. Your first impression starts when you wake up in the morning. That's really a key trait. Uh, another thing is um, a lot of guys really rely on clever things to say or cool things to say or cool ways to brag about something they did or something they have. And that's not important or it's not as important as what you're communicating non-verbally. So your body language, your posture, your eye contact, the way you sit, stand, and walk, all of those things speak to you and speak to other people about what kind of confidence level you have. And we all know that confidence in, is one of the, the largest attraction switches that women or anybody has. So you need to realize that you can walk up and say, I just bought a Lamborghini, check it out, I'm so rich, my dad's famous. That stuff's not going to do anything for you if you're all hunched over and weird and awkward and looking at the ground. However, Mm -hmm. you can be a broke-ass dude uh, who sleeps on your friend's couch, and if you've got the confidence and swagger to back it up, you're still going to find yourself with girls that just don't care. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so obviously... For us, the happy medium is somewhere in between there where you're confident and you have your stuff together. That's what makes a good, a good confident guy who is able to get into a relationship with a high-quality woman. And that's what we're obviously going for at the end. So, you know, the body language stuff is all outlined for free on our show. Um, I would say there's hours of awesome tips. They're all free at theartofcharm.com slash podcasts. If you go there, you'll find a bunch of – free stuff you can load onto your iPod. The newsletter's full of good stuff. Um, that's also free. So if you hit theartofcharm.com, you're going to see we're, give away, uh, we're giving away a lot of stuff that I encourage you to go out and try for yourself. Cool. Um, looks like we've got a couple guests in here that okay. want to ask some questions. Um, Let's do it. I'm trying to figure out how to unmute and my screen froze. So give me just a second. All right. Do your uh, thing. Yeah, make it happen. Let's see here. Bunny, can you hear us? Okay, hold on. Okay. I think he was in, but he disappeared. Okay, I guess not. Um, <laughs> Frank, you got anything else? Uh, okay. Well, I'll just uh, end it on a scenario then. All right, let's say you're, you're, from Cal- you're in California now, right? Uh, I live in California now. You live in California. Let's say it's, it's late. It's a late night on Friday night. You're in a bar, you have this friend, and uh, he's been striking out with the ladies all night. It's, it's, it's last call now. It's last call. What yeah. does he need to do in order to, to make it happen? Is there anything he can do, or is it too late? What can he do? What would you tell him? What advice would you give him if he's been sulking all night, but he, want, he really wants to take a girl home tonight? What, what, okay. What, give him the good. So we're just, we're just going straight down. We're going to sleaze mode right now. That's all right. Okay, fine. I see you. I see where you're at. That's fine. 
I'm willing. I'm willing to go there with you guys because you guys are cool. All right. So, <laughs> so at last call, you know, the the best thing to do if he is in a place, if y'all are in a place where you've been l lugging around all night, sitting around being shy, not doing anything. Um, if you can change venues, do it because what you know, once you get all sulky and quiet and slow in one place, it's hard to bring it up. Mm -hmm. But if there's a place maybe right across the street and you're like, all right, we got 20 minutes, man. And you walk over there and the doorman goes, well, we're, we're done. You go, listen, we're just, last, we're just here for last call. They go, all right, fine, let them in. Now you got to go high energy, go right up to the girls. The girls know it's last call. They know what's up. At that point, if they're still there, they're putting up with all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. You don't have to walk in and be smooth. You don't have to walk in and be – there's no slow play here. Walk up, start talking to the girls. Um, you go for the girls that are giving you the signals, right? The girls that are smiling at you, the girls that are looking at you. So you go around, say hi to people. I mean, literally, you don't have to have anything fancy. You just be like, hey, what's going on? How's your night going? The girls that turn and face you, that's one of the most uh, intense signals of attraction, and it sounds really simple, but in a t at a time like that, it's a really good indicator of attraction, girls that are smiling at you. It, you start talking, and then you got to start touching right away. And I don't mean grabbing them up, but start touching right away. Go up, talk to the girl, say, how's your night going? Reach out, take her hand, and hold on to it. Don't do the handshake. Take her hand and hold on to it. Pull her in a little bit. Start talking with her. Because it's 1.30, right? She knows what's up. She's either with the program. You're either with us or against us, right? Like she's with the program or she's out. You know, you yeah. grab that hand and you, and you pull her in a little bit. And if she goes, you know, you know you're done. Yeah. But if she's if she's into it, then good. And you go, hey, me and my boy Franco, we're going to head to another place after this. Go back to our place and, and hang out for a bit. You guys should come with us. Now, there you go. And if they're like, well, I don't know. We're tired. We have class in the morning. It's like, next. Yeah. But – if, if they're like, oh, okay, let me just see what my friends want, then you, instead of waiting for her friends, because this, this is where everybody fails, instead of waiting for her friends to figure it out, you go, cool, introduce me to your friends. And she'll go, hey, Angela, come over here. And now she's pulling her friends into you and your buddy and her are talking, right? you got to make sure that you're talking with her friends. Because if you're just waiting for her friends to maybe be on board, the friends are going to go, I don't know who these guys are. You were talking to them, but I don't know who these guys are. You want them all to like you at the end of the night, and you, you lead them, right? You go, all right, well, we're heading back. Now, you've still got her hand. You take her friend's hand, and you walk them right out the door. Mm. Walk them right out the door. Because if you're waiting for them to make a move, they're not going to make the move. you got to make the move. you got to lead the way. you got to take them home. Because if you don't, they're going to find a reason not to go, or they're going to get tired, or they're going to go, well, I don't know. Because girls don't want to feel – they don't want to feel slutty. They they don't want to feel like they're trying to follow you home. They just want to be able to go, I don't know, it just happened. These cool guys came up and we ended up hanging out. <laughs> you know, that's what you want to happen. You don't you don't want to rely on them for any type of, of for anything. They're not gonna leave the way. Gonna make way. Yeah. Hey, so, no someone, decision making. So in a sense changing venues is like refreshing a web page. <laughs> right. It's like it's like what you you hit reset, right? Like, yeah, it's like reset. you hit reset on the game. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Because if, if something happens in that other place or you've been walking around all night and the girls are like, why aren't these guys talking to anybody? Then you start talking to them. They're like, oh, I see. They're waiting for us to get drunk so they can come up and pull us at the end of the night. Plus, you know, you're not necessarily in the mood at that point. You know, you're sitting at some place doing your thing. And then, you know, if you go to a new place, you can walk in and be like, yeah, let's do this, right? Let's go, let's go, let's go. Whereas you can't just stand up from the bar stool at the place you've been in all night and do that. It's going to look weird, it's going to feel weird, and you're going to lose momentum really fast. Checkmate. Hey, yeah. man, we, we appreciate the, the, the in-depth info and the tips. Um, My pleasure. And, and, and it's been really good talking to you. Um, so we're about to wrap up, but um, uh, uh, go ahead and recap and, and let people know how they can get a hold of you and, and sure. where they can see you. There's a newsletter, which is a great way to get a bunch of free stuff and keep in touch with us. We don't send out a ton of spam. We don't sell a bunch of crap. We don't send you email every damn day. None of that. It's at theartofcharm.com. And then there's some free stuff there as well, audio there, podcast there. And then for the guys that want to, like, dive in and really learn this stuff, we got a $1 trial of our Art of Charm Academy. And if you go to theartofcharm.com, you can find the Academy dollar trial there. So that's a dollar for the first month. 
um, of the whole thing. And that's our online university where we teach a lot about body language, eye contact, what to do, what to say. And it's very orderly. You get new stuff every couple of days on there, and you get missions and drills and stuff that you can do on your own. Cool. Hey, let me ask you this because we, we kind of just we, – we're getting our feet wet in, in, in doing the media broadcasting. And, um, Definitely. And this Google Hangout, like we really like and we've done a couple interviews before this one. Um, can you give us some pointers and, and tell us how your experience was um, being on this and, and maybe give us some tips of how we can improve? Sure. Yeah, definitely. I like this. Um, this is a cool way to interact because I'm looking at you. I'm not just on the phone like walking around my room trying to figure out what I'm going to eat for lunch, which is what <laughs> I do in a lot of interviews. Um, so it keeps people more engaged, I think. Um, I would definitely take this file use it as a video podcast, and I would also rip the audio out and make the audio available because there's going to be a lot of people who are like, I don't want to sit here and look at Jordan's face and Franklin's <laughs> face. I don't, give a, I don't give a crap. I don't care. You know, I just want to listen on my iPod on the treadmill about this stuff. You know, so rip the audio and make that a separate download for people that don't want to watch the video. Okay. Um, uh, additionally, I would say – uh, make sure that you guys have a good, strong internet connection because the one thing that I noticed was there were a couple of times where there were like little video glitches, um, which is kind of distracting, or like the color would fade out, which is funny because it makes you guys look really funny. Um, you guys already, you guys already have like dark skin, so you turn black and white and then it's the color. That's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really kind of weird. Um, and then I know something you might not be able to do much about but there's been a times where people have walked by background um, and they're like looking in the camera and it, it looks really weird. But there's not much you can really do about a lot of that. I'd say right. the only thing you can do is maybe try to be in a quiet place, plug in your internet if you can instead of using wireless, hope for the best. But my major suggestion would be rip the audio out of the podcasts as well so people can have it as a separate download. But I think this is a good um, methodology. You guys are good hosts. Um, you guys have you know the the infrastructure set up nice. I got plenty of communication before I came on, which is nice because there's nothing I it makes me more uncomfortable than booking something a week before or two weeks before, and then the morning of I still have nothing in my inbox, mm -hmm. and then like ten minutes before showtime, someone sends me a text and goes, "Are you ready?" And I'm like, "Well, yeah, but I didn't even know if this was going down until." Then. <laughs> you know? yeah. But I got mm. plenty. Of, I, you know, I got you hit me up on Facebook. I got like two or three emails, and then beforehand, I got a call, and I was like, "This is good. These guys are on top of their stuff." Um, you'd be surprised how many people just cold call and go, "You, you ready to do this?" And I'm like, "Geez, we talked a month ago. I figured this was off." You know, mm -hmm. so. That's good. You, you're going to have a lot fewer guests who are unprepared or, or like, you know, flaky, mm -hmm. you know, by, by being so good with communication. So props on that. Cool, cool. Well, Jordan Harbinger, it's been really great hanging out with you, man. And um, Yeah, my please, pleasure. Please come back again. And uh, we're, we're going to post this as soon as we get it all processed, and we'll shoot, shoot you a link to it and all of that stuff too. So Great, great. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. You have a good day, all right? All right. Yeah, All right. you too. Take, Take care. Later, later, Jordan. Later, man.